All right, guys, gentlemen, you're on video now. Okay, so listen. Okay, all right. What, what did we say with the Espionage and Sedition Acts? What was key about this? Oh, they couldn't speak. Uh, you couldn't speak against the government. Good. You couldn't speak out against the government. Couldn't speak out against war. But guys, how? Why? Why would they pass such a law? It seems so obvious. Right there in the First Amendment gives us the right to to free speech, and that was created because of political speech, really. Right? Yes. Uh, because they were afraid of like espionage and sabotage from German American. People. Yes. You have possible German American agents. You have. You know the other idea is look, they're going to have a large portion of the country away at war. If people in the home front back home are protesting against the war, you're weakening their ability to fight, was part of the logic. You know, um, what if you get someone, oh, like Eugene Debs, who, would st who was already a well known labor leader, who did the Pullman strike, gentlemen? Right? The Pullman strike uh, was organized by Eugene Debs, a major labor leader, well known socialist at the time. Right, who uh, had a lot of popularity among labor work, uh, labor unions. You know, he got up in Indianapolis and stood up and said that the draft is immoral, it is unconstitutional, it's illegal. Don't sign up for the draft. If he can, what if he sways millions of um, of young men to say no? So he gets arrested via the Sedition Act and sent to a ten-year prison sentence. You got to remember, Debs was not some unknown guy off to the side. He was a well-known, nationally known labor leader, right? But there was, you know, fairly well-known opposition to the war, but it, it pretty much gets silenced. Hey, one of the early, uh, um, pop music songs or protest songs is "I Didn't Raise My Boy to Be a Soldier." It may sound pretty old now, but it was a it was a cool song in 1917. Of course, we got a. Okay, so you just failed the class. 1966. This is 1915. <laughs> big song in uh, 1917, but uh, that didn't really dampen the war effort for the United States too much. You had a rather, you know, it was a rather popular movement to go and send your boys, quote, over there. Here's a, a, an, a, a, an opposite. <laughs> this is, let's see if we have... <laughs> Jimmy Cagney, famous. Famous actor. This is done years later after the war, but this was typical of the World War I effort and the uh, you know the, the popularity of go and fight for your country. This is a famous movie about a 
famous uh, Broadway songwriter, George M. Cohan. phrase at the time over there was you know over in Europe uh, in 1918 a uh, protester sues the federal government for having been uh, silenced for speaking out against the war effort it becomes a famous Supreme Court case Schenck versus the United States in 1918 and it comes down to the question of this which is more important your right to free speech to speak your mind, your political opinion about the war effort, or any other effort in the, you know, any other political question, or the national security of the United States, right? This is an important question, which comes first when they, when they clash, okay? In the 1918 Supreme Court decision, the Supreme Court basically said national security comes first. The standard, which is going to be the standard for free speech for many years to come after this is this. If your speech creates a danger to someone else, then you do not, it is not protected by uh, the Constitution, right? So it's one thing to speak out and say, uh, I hate uh, this politician, I hate Trump, I hate uh, Clinton, whatever it might be, <clears throat> and criticize the policies. What if that speech somehow causes a danger to someone else? That's where you draw the line. That's what was created at the time by the Supreme Court called the clear and present danger test. Johnny, in many cases, <clears throat> what they do is they say, how do we legislate? How do we decide on future cases? What about the next time there's a debate as to whether my free speech is protected by my constitutional rights or not? Well, here's what we do. We test that speech and say, would that speech cause danger to others? If so, Sorry, it does not uh, get protected by the Constitution. If it's something that's considered to be <clears throat> relatively harmless and just an opinion, then it is protected. Yeah. So that's why you can't say like fire and time. This is that's this is the actual case where that famous example came from. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Supreme Court Justice, said, "Look, you can't just say I have the free speech to stand up in a crowded theater and cause a riot by yelling fire. Some guy gets killed, and." I say, I'm, I'm just, I guess this is my free speech. No, that guy would be arrested and that guy would be charged, who knows with what, but that's not protected. Now, many people argued against that and said, well, that's not the same here. Eugene Debs is not causing any deaths by saying the, 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 uh, the draft is immoral, the draft is, is unconstitutional. So many thought that this was, you know, should not have been accepted, but this becomes a standard for many years. Believe it or not, it's, Something similar to this, the clear and present danger test that actually protects lots of free speech in the future. Years later, people involved in pornography would use the clear and present danger test to say, hey, it's a, it's a harmless magazine. It's a form of expression. Uh, it became such a big deal that in the 1960s, 70s, when pornography became such a big deal, the Supreme Court used to have to get, kid you not, pornographic videos and watch them in the judge's chambers and decide which is a clear and present danger. I don't know, someone getting hurt, child pornography, yes, that would be illegal. There's a danger to others. Or, I guess, harmless fun. One judge got so fed up of having to watch hours and hours of porno for his job. 
He said, I'm just going to, I mean, he's stop. Getting he's getting paid. You should look at him. I think his name, his name was Judge Potter. And he just got a, he just had enough and said, I'll, I a famous phrase. He said, I, I'll know it when I see it. Okay. Just by looking at the video title, whatever it might be. So it, still to this day, free speech question. Okay. More importantly, we just talked about George M. Cohen. That was uh, the portrayal of Cohen there. Guys like uh, the federal government loved people like Cohen because they wanted to whip up support for the war. How do we make it popular? Cohen was the number one songwriter on Broadway. Actually, if you go on Broadway on 42nd Street, there's only one statue ever built on Broadway for a Broadway performer. It's for Cohen, who wrote dozens and dozens of musicals or songs for musicals at the time. And he wrote that famous song over there. That's what they wanted. They wanted the war to be popular. They made cool uh, advertisements. Uncle Sam, I want you sign up for the army so you're not getting uh, drafted. And they made sure, they said, your cause is just. Look at the enemy. He's a monster. He's a hun. He's a medieval personality. You know what I mean? And Attila if you were, yes, literally Attila the Hun. That's what they're talking about. They, they, they uh, equated Germans with the ancient Central European Huns. And uh, if you're not signing up for the war, you're giving your cash. Remember what a war bond was, right? War bond was a voluntary loan by an individual to the government. And it was, it was a lot of pressure. Guy would come by with a clipboard at your job, you know, say, Mr. Barr, uh, notice that uh, you're not in the war, huh? Okay. Uh, how about $100, which in those days would be a week's wow. pay, if not more, right? Actually, more than a week's pay. How about $100 war bond? What do you say? Give $100 to the federal government. No? no? Uh, okay. Good. Next day you walk in, giant sign of a bunch of little names that say all the people who gave in. And oh, those who did not, bar, aisles, you know, and so, on, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, you want your name off that list? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'll give it a give me 100 bucks. And what's the big deal? You're going to get 100 bucks, and you're going to get 100, 200, and 609 dollars back whenever it's, it comes due. And the only way in which you don't get your money back is if we lose the war. You want us to lose the war? Give your 100 bucks. <laughs> Guess what happens six weeks from now, or six months from now? I come back. For another hundred. Ah, oh, it's gave hundred last time. How about two hundred? You know, you've been working here. All the soldiers are actually out there dying, and you're over here working in a nice office. So I think you'll give two hundred dollars this time. A lot of pressure to give cash. Right? Right. So make make sure you understand what a Creel committee was. Uh, George Creel worked for the federal government. His job was to come up with cool slogans, cool songs cool posters, ways in which to get people, you know, hey, he's the one who would come out and say, look, don't don't call them Frankfurters anymore. Frankfurt is a, is a city in in, uh, in Germany. Can't do that. There are enemies. Call them victory dogs. Don't call them hamburgers after Hamburg in Germany. Call them Salisbury steaks. Salisbury, that's what they call them in England. Actual Salisbury steak is pretty nasty, though, if you ever had one. Right. Anyway. You know what's going to tell you that? Okay. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> All right. Okay. War costs a lot of money. Very interesting the way they finance the war. One war bonds, as we said, so-called victory loans. Government raised twenty-three billion dollars to pay for the war, but they also did something that had never been done before in any large number. They took money from income taxes. Strangely enough, the United States had not allowed had not allowed income tax to officially be collected. They had found ways to collect money over the years, but it was never actually uh, given as a right to the federal government until 1913, when a constitutional amendment was passed giving the federal government the right to tax your income. Right, so. We think of income tax as a big issue for us now. That's the main way in which the federal government raises money. And until 1913, they were not allowed to actually do it. They had to raise money mainly through tariffs and other things. Check out the, the, the income tax rate in 1913. You know, the rate would be about 1% on incomes between three and $20,000. 1% 
multiply by that, that by about 40, and you're talking about the only people who paid income taxes in 1913, the first year of its existence, would be people that maybe make today between 120 and $800,000. And they only had to pay 1%. No one know what your federal income tax rate is now? About 37% is for the, the wealthiest. You make over about a half million dollars, you pay 37%. The poorest will pay 10% and it is a sliding scale of graduated tax rate. Someone making 100,000 usually around the 24% range, okay? So imagine 1%. Income taxes were relatively small and aimed at the wealthier people in the economy. Notice what happens in just three years. It just happens that we allow the federal government to collect income taxes starting in 1913. Then the world goes to war in 1914. And three years later, the federal government is taxing people at the rate of 15%. When we actually get into the war, we're about to get into the war, 1917, check out the tax rates. There would be 20 graduated steps. Right now, there's about six, right? Different tax rates. And the top rate on income over $2 million would be 67%. Everyone follow? That means if you make $3 million, the last million dollars that you make will be taxed. 670000 of that would go to Uncle Sam. As we said, right now, the most you will pay in income taxes is 37%. That's the highest rate. Right there around World War II, 67. And when we actually get into the war... We jack it up to 73%. You also got taxed if you made money in the stock market or selling a property. Okay? You bought a house for $100,000, sold it for $200,000. You think you made $100,000? No. 77% of that would go to the federal government. Right? You make a big chunk in the stock market, federal government takes a big chunk. Yeah? When you say top rate, you mean top rate income? Top rate means we, we have what's called a graduated income tax. So, for example, the poorest people, if you make zero to $10,000 right now, you pay 10%. People who make 10000 to like uh, 70000 or so, they pay at 15%, and it rises at different steps. So that over, over 450000 now, you get taxed at uh, 37%. That's what's called... The top rate, also known as the marginal rate. Okay. okay. How many guys sign up for economics? Dudes, you should all be taking economics next year. Take AP, that's fine, but take economics. Take AP, take honors, whatever. Take economics. That's fine. Okay. All right. Made, you know, what's important note to note, gentlemen, about World War One are the huge changes that take place, how, how vastly it affects the country. For example, as you know, in the South, African-Americans had been living under Jim Crow laws since the 1870s and starting in 1896, now, thanks to the Plessy decision, they, are, they have been officially segregated most parts of the South had taken away the right to vote through various means, right? Grandfather clauses, literacy tests, poll taxes, etc. And still, though, the vast majority of African Americans lived in the South. Question might be, what, why hadn't they moved to the North? Why hadn't they moved around? There was no real impetus, no real connection to the North until World War I. The U.S. Uh, factory system obviously expands the economy has a tremendous demand for labor and of course they were getting much of that from Europe but during World War I much of the immigration from Europe slows down this therefore is an impetus for African Americans to move in huge numbers from the southern rural states up to northern cities New York Boston Philly Detroit Kansas City Chicago and more right Factories all over the place looking for labor, African Americans moving. It's sometimes referred to as the Great Migration. In just a short amount of time, your typical African American goes from being a rural citizen to being 
largely urban and causes great upheaval. Right? Yes, question? For the Great Migration, is that the factories were needed in like Desperately needed more labor. So they used to get them mainly from European immigrants. Now they're not getting as much of them because of World War One. African Americans fill in and they start moving up in big numbers to northern cities. Okay. Um, super. And that is going to have a great effect on the United States in many ways. Okay. I mean, think about it. You hear the phrase, the famous phrase, Harlem Renaissance is referred to around this time period when, you know, Harlem, New York becomes kind of the, the center of African-American cultural life for the whole nation, right? If not the world in many ways, uh, people refer to, the, to Harlem sometimes not even as a geographic phrase, okay? Uh, when they create the Harlem Globetrotters, they were created in Chicago, okay? But, they were obviously referring to the, the large population and the, the, uh, the cultural growth that took place in New York as an example of uh, African-American success nationwide. All right, business also goes undergoes tremendous changes. The federal government, need, here, we have a problem here in World War I that needs to kind of be addressed. What do we know about the capitalist system? Does government, in pure capitalism, does government tell businesses what to do? No. In pure capitalism, government sits back and, and they have a supposedly laissez-faire relationship to government. The logic is, uh, sorry, relationship to business. Businesses respond to supply and demand. They'll make more stuff if it'll make them more money. If it doesn't make them money, they will not make the product. Why would this be a problem in wartime? Depends on what you're making. Well, yeah. The, the United States needs war material. We need guns, we need bullets, we need so on. Do you think that it's good for businessmen to uh, hold the federal government hostage and say, hey, you want guns? You want airplane parts? You want tank engines? You better pay up good. Right? That was a big problem during the Civil War. War profiteers, businessmen, would charge the federal government for insane amounts of money, get stupid rich, and you often give them shoddy goods. Question is, should government step in and take over or have control over business? That's a slippery slope. If you let them do that, aren't you saying government has the right to go and do whatever they want, take over business, become more socialistic? If you don't let them do that, could these greedy businessmen cost us the war just because they want to make a buck, you know, yes. and bankrupt the country. So they come up with kind of a hybrid. They create something called the War Industries Board. They put one of the most famous stockbrokers, businessmen out there, a guy named Bernard Baruch, and he has a certain amount of control. He has the right to go to Ford Motors and say, look, we will make a deal with you, but we are going to dictate the price we're going to give to you. We're not going to pay your price. If you refuse, if you say, hey, federal government, you're not paying us enough money, we will then shut you down. We will then sanction you. So it was a kind of a mixed relationship. He had a lot of power over business to be able to tell them what to do. And, hey, look, businesses made a lot of money on this. They might not as much as if they had complete freedom, but it was a big question as to whether government should get involved in the economy. All right. Baruch, therefore, gets extensive power to dictate production goals. We all know, gentlemen, that the probably the most, the, the biggest and most powerful industry in business at the time was railroads. And if railroads would not cooperate, we would never be, it didn't matter what we made, they would, they would uh, you know, they would bankrupt the country. Federal government, no joke basically takes over the railroads temporarily for 1917, 1918. Well, what do we need railroads for more? We would need to move goods. We're producing goods in Kansas City and Detroit. We need millions of dollars worth of goods shipped to the shore to get goods to, to Europe. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so we need that transportation. Good question, though. Uh, and moving troops, etc. The government needs to commandeer these railroads, and they did. Hey, around this time, we were fighting, or the United States was trying to resist the worldwide movement towards socialism. Remember, Russia was in the midst 
of a communist revolution. People in America did not want to go that route. Yet, on the other hand, we're basically saying the government's taking over huge chunks of, of the economy, right? Okay. Another big question was, what about labor unions? We talked about these strikes. Haymarket Square strike, Pullman car strike, uh, Homestead strike, and of course the Great Railroad strike. Famous in American history. <clears throat> During World War I, when the government did not want to pay to make sure labor unions got paid too much, they asked labor unions, do us a favor. Don't go on strike. Don't ask for higher wages. We promise we will hook you up when the war is over. Be patriotic, right? And for the most part, labor unions didn't want to be labeled as un-American, so most of the time they, they said fine, okay? All right. Let me just see where. What? Yep, go ahead. I'm gonna skip through. Well, uh, we'll mention Wilson. Let's talk about. Let's talk Wilson. Can we copy this down or not? Uh, let's let's move. Let me move things around. The casualties. Are you meeting all the casualties they have? No, but I, I, I'm using that just to, for you to look at. Okay. Let's look at what actually happened in the war. The United States puts 2 million soldiers in the field in what's known as the AEF, American Expeditionary Force. Guys, we declare war in April of uh, 19... Uh, 1918, uh, 1917, sorry. <clears throat> One of the big questions is, what do we do with these troops when, once we get them over to Europe? What do you think Britain and France wanted? Yeah, they wanted help. They desperately wanted us there. And they wanted the United States troops to fall under British and French control. What do you think would happen if American soldiers went to Europe those soldiers, those British and French soldiers have been fighting for four years. And they just simply said, all right, Americans, you're now going to be under a French or a British commander. What do you think they would have done with us? Go on the front line. Sent us right to the front. You guys have been, you guys have been sitting out for four years. Now it's time for you to take the brunt of the hit. Jack Pershing, John Pershing, our, uh, the head of the American Expeditionary Force, refused to let that happen. He made sure that Americans maintained their autonomy, maintained control. He would have the final say over what Americans did in the war, right? Uh, one group that does a lot of the, the brunt of the fighting are the U.S. Marines. You know what a Marine's, a Marine's job actually is? What is the purpose of the Marines? They come from water. As opposed, yes, good. They fight from the well, naval vessels and they're attacking uh, you know, from water onto land. They're the invasion force, you know, or the occupy, occupying force, whatever it might be, a very difficult job as opposed to the army, which usually is fighting our infantry, but they're fighting inland. The only problem was our army had been decimated, it was very small, and had really been inactive for many years, right? We were now getting tons and tons of brand new soldiers in, and now they're gonna be thrown into a highly technological war without any real experience. So what the United States does was they send at first, mainly the US Marines. The Marines had already been involved all over the Western hemisphere, Haiti, uh, Dominican Republic, Mexico, other places, they actually serve and fight in France along the Western Front. Check out the dates. The United States puts all this effort into the war, and we do not fight for more than five months. We're not really doing anything from June 1918, I mean, until June 1918, and we fight for five months, and in that short amount of time, you know, we pretty much turn the tide of the war. Right. In June of 1918, we fight four, uh, yeah, starting in June, we fight four major battles. Should probably take those down. Along the Western Front, at Chateau Thierry, Saint Mihiel, the Second Battle of the Marne, and finally at Belleau Wood. The U.S. loses one, a last thing you should have, gentlemen, loses 126,000 men. 
How many did we lose in the Civil War? Six hundred thousand in four years. Here we use lose one hundred twenty-six thousand in four months. All right. Yeah. Very high casualty rate, although very small compared to European countries, as we'll see. All right, gents. We'll pick up with this tomorrow. Wait, test is Thursday. Test is Thursday.